Welcome to the Ben and Lauren Show. I'm Ben. This is Lauren. That must be me. <laughs> Hi, Ben. Hi. So we're starting the Ben and Lauren Show late again. So we're a little bit sleepy, but we got our tea and we're comfy. I drank my tea. Yeah. It was sleepy time tea, so if I fall asleep <laughs> in the middle, now you'll know why. I have chamomile and licorice, black licorice. And it's my favorite nighttime tea. Almost all of the sleepy time teas I've tried have mint in them, and mint upsets my stomach. So which is, is weird. It's not supposed to do that. No. So this is my my nighttime tea. <laughs> no coffee for you. Not tonight. <laughs> we start these things at eleven or eleven thirty. It's just sometimes even later than that. And that's that's rough. Well, the kids were wound up really tight tonight. They were insistent that they were going to stay up so that they could hear the Ben and Lauren show. I think they're awake even now. They're they listening. probably are. But we promised them that now we know how to do video splicing, we can turn the video off and we can deal with any interruptions. Yeah, we assured them that. And then put the video back. <laughs> It'll be easy. <laughs> but they're in bed. I read them a total to a book tonight. Oh, they got everything tonight. They even got chocolate cake. So they got a bath, chocolate cake, pajamas on, teeth brushed, bedtime story, tucked into bed, the whole night prayed night. over the whole, the whole thing. I had to send Daniel back to bed like three times. They even had piano playing. Oh, yeah. Lauren played the piano tonight. It was very nice. It's a rare occurrence. <laughs> These days. So the girls had a good night's sleep. They should be pretty well well tucked in by now. Let's hope. Let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lauren, what did we do this week? Uh, let's go back to Sunday. Um, we took out another wall in the basement. I took another wall out in the basement. Maybe we could take the camera down there sometime, see our messy basement. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the process of getting our house under much better organization. And when we started um, after our construction, we had whole rooms in our house that weren't able to be used because things had just been kind of shuffled around and jammed in there. So our whole upper story of our house is in use. Now we're moving on to the basement. So the idea is to clean out all the various rooms of the house, which are pretty much done. And now we're moving down into the basement. We got a lot of stuff out of there already. We do. And somebody had finished our basement at some point in the past. And whoever finished, it is. quotation marks. Whoever it is knows even less about building than I do. I, um, I took this wall apart this week. Mm -hmm. And the studs were sideways. Let's start with <laughs> You know, normally you put the two by fours, you put them 16 yeah, inches. Not exactly center. well done. You need a sill plate, a top plate. It didn't have either one. And they put the, they, they nailed them straight to the joist sideways. <laughs> wow. And then my dad cut them all apart when they raised the staircase. So they were just floating there attached to old, you know, that cardboard wood paneling. Uh -huh. It was bad. El cheapo. It's all down now. I feel much better. It looks nicer. When you go down there, it's all kind of open and. One of the, the, underneath the stairs was kind of one of those corners that gets filled up with junk. It's just whenever you have a corner, mm -hmm. and we got all the junk out of there, all the old paint buckets and things we weren't using. So. And I think about 25 years worth of cobwebs. <laughs> it's a great relief. It feels good. <laughs> Plugging along. And I managed to get a bunch of my old computers thrown away. I had a big computer collection because I would work on computers, and people, if they were obsolete or done, they would say, what do I do with this thing? And I say, throw it away. And they say, do you want it? And I just can't resist. I'm like, well, I'll scrap it for parts. Or maybe I'll refurbish it or There's whatever. There's a piece of RAM in here somewhere. So I got a big collection of printers and computer towers with motherboards and RAM and um, CPUs. So I had fun bringing them up, and I, I did scrap them. I have a box full of CPUs now and RAM. And well, I guess it takes up less than all the computers. Do. And we got rid of the towers. The towers were big and bulky, so... I wanted, I wanted to throw all of it out, and Ben's like, no, no, I have to take it apart, save the hard drives, and save them. We had old printers, and one of them we saved because the girls thought it looked neat. <laughs> so we saved it. We have one printer saved. You saved it because they thought it looked neat? Yeah. Does it work? Yeah. Oh, it's wow. one of the ones That's that works. Useful. It's our only color printer in the house. So we... Okay. <laughs> You can't hear it, but the Abigail is having the Lauren and Su or the Abigail and Susanna show. Except she just found out that Susanna is sleeping. She's been abandoned. <laughs> she says, "Welcome to the Abigail and Susanna show." Susanna, wake up! <laughs> wake up, Susanna! <laughs> Daniel's tooth finally came in. That's been 
that's been uh, making him antsy for a couple weeks. So that's relevant to us because now we can sleep through the night. Now I'm working on getting him to sleep through the night. Yeah, he wakes up, he starts to get out of bed because he wants to come over to the bed and cuddle with Mama and Daddy. And I'm like, Daniel, go back to bed. And there's this silence in the new year. <laughs> thump, 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 thump. As he goes back to bed, he walks like he's an elephant. <laughs> but he's not waking up screaming anymore. That is yeah. difficult. When you're sleeping and you're completely out and then you hear a scream and <laughs> yeah he was doing that for a couple of weeks where he'd wake up with this really loud squeal oh, because his teeth hurt and that's the worst way to wake up <sighs> adrenaline rush three yeah. times a night yeah and you wonder if he's okay he's fine it's just his two thirds yeah he would calm down but the squeal oh yeah. man except last night i had a hard time sleeping oh yeah the chirp well it all started with Abigail, we, we played this we played this Nancy Drew mystery game, and it starts off with a fire. And Abigail, for some reason, is now terrified that we're going to have a fire in the house. So last night, I sat her down, and I said, here's a smoke detector. This is how a smoke detector works. <laughs> and I said, the only time you'll hear the smoke detector in our house is either if there's a fire or if it beeps. Because, you know, it needs a new battery. But that doesn't happen very often. And Abigail goes, good, because I think it would scare me. So I tucked her all into bed. I went and I laid down. And as my head hit the pillow, I hear, beep. (laughs) 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 What are the odds? (laughs) What are the odds of that? And all I could think was, Abigail's going to wake up and she's going to be scared. And then every time that stupid, and then I didn't want to get up and change the smoke detector because I was really tired and I was afraid that You should have said, Ben, get up and put a new battery in the smoke detector. Well, I did say something to you, but I think you were too sleepy. I said, Ben, that stupid smoke detector is beeping. And you're like, you're like, what smoke detector? (laughs) (laughs) I slept through it fine. I should have just gotten up and changed it, but I didn't want to do that because I had this feeling that if I unplugged it, they're hardwired smoke detectors. It could make some of the other ones go off. And I thought no, that would be if the icing you popped, on the cake. If you popped the, if you popped the <laughs> battery out of it, it wouldn't have gone off. Can you imagine saying this when the detector's off in the middle of the night? <laughs> Abigail would never recover. <laughs> That's the best time for a, for a uh, what do you call it, a fire, a fire drill. drill. <laughs> we can have a fire drill in the middle of the night while Abigail's terrified about fires. So every 30 seconds last night, I was trying to go to sleep. Beep. <laughs> Beep. And it's timed in a way that you just start to fall asleep. And then it beeps again. <laughs> and then you just start to fall asleep again, and it beeps at you. One time we ignored one of those long enough that our budgie learned to cheat, just like the smoke detector. Yeah, yeah we woke up in the morning, and, and we, we hear... We keep hearing it. It's like we, we hear the smoke battery. <laughs> we put the new battery in, and all of a sudden we hear... Beep. We're like, whoa, whoa, what was that? It was our bird. <laughs> the bird was imitating it. <laughs> so, that was last night. So we replaced the smoke detector that was, battery. That was Bob, wasn't it? No, actually it was Daisy. Daisy. Yeah. We miss Daisy. Well, we've got Esther now, so. I do miss Daisy, though. Esther's a nice bird. I like Esther. Yeah, she's she's uh, spunkier than, than mm-hmm. Daisy. Anyway, so that was our that was our night last night was the smoke detector. So we had an evening out, Lauren and I. That was Thursday night. These are always big events. That was a big event going out. And we had a friend of ours watching the girls. And normally what we do is we sort of sneak out. We kind of get them distracted and they're playing with the toys or talking with whatever. And we kind of sneak out quietly. Nobody, you know, we don't want the fuss. Well, I thought it, I also thought it would be a kindness for, for Miss Charlene because um, if everyone starts crying and complaining. Now, I know from my past with you that when you leave, they make a big fuss too. Mm-hmm. However, I'm going to make sure I get closer to the mic. I have a feeling that we're coming in and out with that. However, uh, they make a huge fuss right when you're leaving, and then they're fine. They're cheerful. So I figured that would happen with Charlene also. But we thought it would be better for her not to make the big fuss, so we mm-hmm. would kind of wait till they were distracted and leave. But our kids are on to us. Yes, they are. So this week, when we were getting ready to Good leave... Good night, Abigail. Good night. Do we need to pause it? Do we need to pause things and come and have a discussion? Screen. <laughs> so, as we were leaving, they chased us to the door and said, well, You can't leave, don't go! Susanna tried hiding my coat. 
So we decided to be very upfront this time. We said, goodbye, we're going, we'll be back in a little while. And they cried, and they immediately got over it. And I so think that's a lesson to us as parents, not to sneak away. Yeah, we've been big on nobody sneaking, mm -hmm. and I think we were getting a little lazy on that. So when it's time for us to go out, we just need to address our children and say, good night, we'll be back in a few hours. And that's it. And this brought up a major subject of philosophical discussion, which we haven't worked all the way through yet. Well, the concept of bait and switch. The concept of, yeah, bait and switch with your children or meeting head on situations that you know they might not like. But it gives an opportunity for both of you to exhibit character, you and your children. You to tell your children up front what's going on and your children to build the character to respond to it. And that's what we expect from them. We want the children to be up front with us. Right. If they could be up front with us, we can most certainly be up front with them. So when it's time for us to leave, we don't sneak out while they're not watching. We say goodbye, be good, see you when we get back. And if there is a fuss, we deal with the fuss. Yeah. And that, you know, that takes a lot of discipline to be able to do. It's tempting to just avoid the drama, avoid the upset, and just sort of figure out a way to make it work without a lot of it being a big deal. Well, even, even like, when, one, when the kids ask, Can't, may I have this or that or whatever, you want to be able to just give them whatever it is they want so that they're peaceful and you're peaceful and you go on with your day. It actually takes a lot of backbone as a parent to be consistently weighing whether or not what they're asking of you is something good for them to have and then mm -hmm. being very straightforward with them about telling them no if that's necessary. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to think, if I say yes, then they'll be quiet and happy. If they say no, then they're going to cry and make a big fuss. I better just avoid the conflict and just give them what they want. That's no way to parent, though. I mean, no, you're placating your children. And then the other, the other technique of when you know you're going to be doing something your child does not particularly want to do, to try to bribe them into it by telling them you're going to do fun stuff, mm -hmm. when... Really, what you should do is be up front with them and say, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And they're going to say, I don't like doing X, Y, and Z. And that's your opportunity to teach character. Right. The world doesn't revolve around you, and not everything you do in your life has to be entertainment and fun. It's not just about what you like and don't like. It is good It is good to be at peace with and enjoy what you are doing in your life, not have everything be fun. So the training is to try to figure out what is good. Not just what is enjoyable or what is fun, but what is actually good. And sometimes doing what is good is not always fun. It's, that's just the way it is. Sometimes doing your duty is good, and it's not always fun. The trick is to love doing good so much that no matter what it is, you enjoy it. You, you get do. joy out of it, even if it's something you don't really want to do. And... Um, we're all working on that still. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and it's also to learn to have joy in what's going on in your life, even if it's not something that is necessarily something on the face of it that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that you need to squeeze something that you enjoy into your life every day to make your life livable. It's to enjoy the things that do need doing mm -hmm. and find a way for that to be the case. If you have to do the dishes every day, learn how to at least take that on philosophically and cheerfully. I heard the phrase Christian hedonism recently, and it's a, a gentleman by the name of John Piper. When I hear Christian hedonism, my mind goes to the worst possible idea. Hedonism means seeking pleasure, and Christian hedonism is not as bad as it sounds. It doesn't really mean live a completely lawless and terrible life. It means be motivated by what you believe God will be pleased by. And so find pleasure in pleasing God, which, which sounds pretty good. The trouble, though, is that the ultimate conclusion is that if I don't find pleasure in doing this, I ought not do it. Because everything should be motivated by what pleases God. So if God says, and when I say say, I mean it's written in his words, when he says to do something, love your enemy, and you say, but I don't get any pleasure in loving my enemy, then by the doctrine of Christian hedonism, you're exempt from that. Because you should only do those things that 
will bring you pleasure because you don't want to do it begrudgingly. God doesn't want you to do anything against your what is pleasurable to you. Was that really what they were saying? Yeah, it's all about hedonism, pleasure. Hmm. I thought it was, well, my impression was what they were saying is that you should obey God because to obey God brings you pleasure. Right. Which, it, it's not, that's a little bit different than you only obey what brings you pleasure. I well, mean, it's it's a two-way street. It's it's the seek, the goal, and what motivates a Christian hedonist is pleasure. Right. But I didn't under... My understanding of what you were reading to me about the definition didn't say that you only do things that bring you pleasure. It's that you're supposed to, to obey God because it brings you pleasure. Whereas what we understood about obeying God was you obey God because it is good. Mm-hmm. And doing what is good has the effect of bringing you pleasure, but that really shouldn't be... But the pleasure comes with maturity. Right. And it, it brought up the idea of duty versus pleasure. People will say, well, you should never do anything out of duty. You know, if God says to do something, like love your enemies, you shouldn't do it out of duty. You should do it because you want to do it and you have a desire to do it and it's in your heart to do it. So follow your heart, you know. But the truth is, is that sometimes doing good is a duty. It's, it's something that you, you might initially do, not begrudgingly, but you kind of have to make yourself do it. You decide to do it first, and the wanting to do it... Receiving not... pleasure from doing it comes later. Right. Um, and that's a difficult lesson even for more mature people to live by, because the idea of doing things out of duty isn't always appealing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've gotten, last couple generations of people especially have really um, pushed back very hard against the idea that you should do things as a duty. Mm-hmm. That's become an ugly concept to people. Right. But the idea is to seek pleasure, ultimately. It's to find pleasure in doing what is good. So rather than looking at duty or pleasure, which I look at it as, God says to do something, you don't want to do it. Are you going to do it or not? And the answer is you ought to do it whether you want to or not, at least initially, to develop the character that it becomes part of your lifestyle, becomes part of your walk, your your life. Because these words are not idle, these are your life. And the idea is you do that long enough and you receive great pleasure in it because God's words are good. God is good. So ultimately, seeking good will result in performing duty and receiving pleasure but you must be seeking what is good if the if you are motivated by the love of good which causes you to love god but you Mm -hmm. love what is good then there should be (laughs) there should be pleasure that comes in the path but you don't but what christian hedonism as we understood it is to be motivated by seeking pleasure that comes from doing what is good, where we were saying, no, the love of good is its own end, and it has its side effects, but mm-hmm. but we should be aiming for the love of good. And that flowed back into but the real, our children and... Right, but the real fundamental idea is that God is good. And that seems obvious, right? Most Christians will say God is good, of course, you know, all the time. God is good all the time. It's easy to say it. It's a little more difficult to live it because God sometimes will ask you to do things that you don't want to do. And if you acknowledge that God is good, then you will acknowledge that what he wants you to do is good, whether you want to do it or not. And And you you seek that good in what you're doing. And if you have the faith to do it, whether you want to or not, and then you have to trust that you will eventually find great pleasure in doing that Mm -hmm. because it's good. Although I have to say, there's been things that we have done that we did because we knew them to be good. Mm -hmm. And I did not personally find a lot of pleasure in that. Maybe we didn't do it long enough. There's probably a lot more to it. There's probably a lot more to it. Sometimes you do what is good and it is a challenge to do. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of pleasure involved in that challenge. And that's why I think Christian hedonism is going to run a, run afoul of life because there's times when doing what is good, there there may be pleasure later in looking back and saying, I am glad I did what was good. But you're not going to find pleasure in that at that time. It, it just doesn't right. feel well. 
And getting over the, the idea that good is relative to a person. Meaning what's good for you is not good for me and that kind of thing. There is a good. Understanding that God is good and good is absolute and there's an absolute God. And seeking it. Not saying we, we know everything that is good. It's something that's constantly being discovered. You know, not determined. I mean, I guess you can determine it, but you're not creating it. You're just you finding are it. finding it. It exists. You just have to find it. So that, that's been one of the kind of deeper philosophical discussions we've been having over the week. Well, we've been talking about we've been talking about our kids and not manipulating them, how we want to be straightforward with them. And sometimes... It's good to be straightforward with our children. It would be so much easier to just manipulate them or, or kind of coax them into doing stuff. But what is good is to teach them how to handle all situations, whether they're disappointed or not, whether they're happy or not, whatever the case, to love what is good. And for us to love what's good and for them to love what is good, ultimately it will be more peace, even if we may have tears at times where if we'd manipulated them into something, they wouldn't have known to cry. And personally, it's in my nature to manipulate. It's I, probably it in everybody's nature. It's Who in wants my, to have a two-year-old throw a tantrum? My, my initial reaction to deal with the situation is to kind of coax the situation to whatever way I want it to go. And I have to stop a lot and not do that. Mm -hmm. You know, say the answer is no. The answer is no. <laughs> and being be straight, straightforward. Being straightforward, and it's taken a lot of practice to be straightforward. Mm -hmm. It's in my nature to say, you know, what you hear some parents say, "Oh no, honey," you'll say no, but you're not really saying no. The the, the children know it. They yeah. know they know what no means and what. Oh no, no, honey. No, honey. Or one that really brought it to the forefront. I read an article this week about a man who heard. Another a father at a restaurant saying to his young child, four or five year old child, "Honey, do me a favor and just eat one bite of these peas." It's like, ah, uh, you know, this is going to be bad. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So the what we talked a lot about was. We're running kind of long. Okay, but that's what we talked about: uh, acknowledging that God is good, and seeking what is good. And realizing that manipulation is not good. And, Being straightforward. Right. And, and seeking to help our children love what is good. Yeah. And that just flows right into the Torah portion. We, <laughs> we read, we read uh, Exodus, continuing through Exodus, all the way from chapter 6 to chapter 13, I believe. By the way, it was a quiet week this week. That's why we had all these philosophical discussions. <laughs> Quiet in what way? We just didn't do very much. Yeah, we stayed home quite a bit. We, it didn't, a quiet week. we didn't really go out very much. Um, anyway. So we were talking about the plagues. We read through all of the different plagues of Egypt. It was a doozy of a Torah portion. It was a doozy of a Torah portion. And the thing that we noticed was the stench. <laughs> well, the thing that started it was the timing. We realized mm -hmm. that all the plagues must have happened, it looks like, within about a three-week period of time. That was a little project I did today. I was curious how long these plagues took took place. And I started kind of recreating from backwards, you know, how long did it take for these plagues right. to go through. There's a and, few time markers given. Right, and it's not explicit, but from what I can tell, it seems like all of the plagues happened within about three weeks. The, ver the very first plague was a week, and then the first series of plagues was over the second week, and then the final plagues were over the, that final week. So from, we think about seven days before the first of Nisan until the 15th of Nisan, which is when they left Egypt. So that works out to about 21 days. Approximately, yeah. Approximately, that they went through this. And in this time, they had the Nile turn to blood, and they, they mentioned the stench from that. Well, yeah, and, the, all the fish so died So then all the, the fish die. Oh, that's going to stink to high heaven. Mm -hmm. Then all the frogs die. And Another stink to high heaven. And they're talking about piles and piles of frogs. It's millions and millions of frogs. Then the locusts. And and it indicates that they were blown away. And it's hard to tell if they left dead insects Probably all over. Not. But there's a couple more vermin where what happened to those? People get boils. <sighs> terrible infections. And then you have the dead cattle. Yeah. And then you have all the dead people. Yeah. So there's just death and decay everywhere in Egypt. The stench of it must have just been. So going through the plagues, I think we think of the, the children's version 
of the plagues, you know, with, oh, that's funny, look at all those frogs, and oh, look at those locusts, and oh, look at the poor livestock, oh, that's sad. But we don't really think about the aftermath of all these plagues, and they pile up one on top of another on top of another. Really fast. And just the frogs alone, just the fish and the frogs alone, the very first couple plagues. Well, the hail kills a bunch of people, too, because there was, there was the servants who were out in the fields who got killed by the hail. And livestock out in the fields. So you got dead livestock. You've got, it's just, it's got to be nasty. And then the final plague, the death of the firstborn, every household had somebody who had, had died. And they had to bury them right away. That's on top of continuing to bury the frogs and the, 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 the dead fish washing up on the Nile River. And just... You know, when we went um, to... Where was it we went to a couple of years ago on the other side of Michigan? Leelanau Peninsula? Was it? Uh, I want to say Franklin. It wasn't Franklin, though. Well, you're talking about that fish we found. Well, okay, <laughs> I'm going to have to forget the name. But we went, to, we went to the western side of Michigan where there was a nice place where we stayed for about a week. And they had a real nice beach. And the beaches on the other side of Michigan are sand. Mm -hmm. They're really pretty white sand beaches. Not rocky. They're not rocky like they are over on this side. And when we went down to the beach, there was just this really awful stench. It that smelled stank. like like fishy garbage. And the whole one side of the beach was deserted because any time a breeze came in, that's all you could smell was this stench. And finally I thought, well, it'd be really nice to be down at this side of the beach, but, you know, it's really stinky. I need to figure out what's causing the stink. Mm -hmm. So I walked along the water line until I came upon about a four foot long coho salmon mm -hmm. that had washed up on the beach and it was about half decayed. So the bones were showing through and that was where all the stink was coming from. There's one flies all over it. fish. One salmon. One salmon. Can you imagine if all of the fish in a river were up on the shore rotting at the same time? And then on top of that, piles and piles of rotting dead frogs. Egypt would have been unlivable. It's no long. It's no wonder the mixed multitude left. Yeah, I mean Egypt would have been just a, just stinky. It, it was it was stripped clean of all its vegetation. Dirty. People were probably afraid to drink the water, and all. I, I mean, you must have not been able to walk outside without covering your mouth just to try to get through the stench that was Egypt. So the, the practical aspect of the plagues was not the each individual plagues, but the, cum the accumulative effect from each one was more and more stinkiness, if you think about it. And then all of your grain, all of your crops are destroyed from the hail. Just gone. And your livestock are destroyed from the, from the hail. And all the workforce is gone. There's and you've no got, one to clean it up. And you've got people getting sick. And it says that the magicians in Pharaoh's court could not rise because of the boils. And we started wondering, what does that mean? We started realizing that boils start on your face and will often form right around here on your cheek. Right. And if it grows big enough, it'll start affecting your inner ear so you can't right. keep your balance at Typically, any boils show up right around your ears, like right behind your ears and right on your ears and sometimes under your eyes. Under your eyes and on your nose and your chin. And they were told to take the dust and throw it in the air, so presumably the boils started where you would be most exposed, which in their culture would have been their faces. Would have been their faces. And if you think about all of the bacteria and disease floating around in the air from all these dead animals, it's not surprising they were getting... Boil. I think it was supernatural. Well, the, the boils just appeared on everybody. That's not... <laughs> yeah, it, it showed up in one day. But the reason the magicians couldn't stand before Pharaoh was most likely because they had these terrible boils all around their ear, well, yeah. putting pressure on their ear. They probably couldn't stand in front of anybody. They couldn't stand. If you had pressure placed right here on your inner ear, I mean, you can't... You lose your balance. You are, you are devastatingly ill. This is not just an inconvenience. Right. It would have been very painful. It's a staph infection, too. So... We kind of looked a little closer at the plagues of Egypt, and they actually got oh. way worse. <laughs> After looking at them, it was way worse than we can imagine. I don't know how the Egyptians survived that. And the fact that the land of Goshen was mostly unaffected. I mean, I'm sure it still smelled. Not that far away from <laughs> yeah, Egypt. The wind was probably still carrying this tension. And who knows, maybe the wind was blowing south, blowing <laughs> away from Goshen. That'd be a mercy. But, you know, the interesting thing about all that 
is that that was really just betraying the spiritual stench that was there. I wonder right. if that was the physical manifestation of kind of what God smells, so yeah. to speak. So what does it look? What does God see? What does God smell when He looks at the Egyptians? Well, He smells rot, death. What does He see when He looks at us? Well, that's a good question. I mean, they can't possibly have been worse than us. So how does sin smell to God? Probably like Egypt during the plagues. God made the whole land, and because because each one of those plagues was a judgment on the gods of Egypt. Right. So this is what you know how God talks about make these sacrifices. This is a pleasing aroma to me. To mm-hmm. God, it's like yeah, this is what it smells like to me. Yeah. Doesn't he describe the stench has risen up to my nostrils? Yes. He describes sin as a stench, like death. The wages of sin is death. That's what God smells when we sin. Well, if our last show was lighthearted, we just made up for it all. (laughs) Let's talk about the plagues of Egypt and the stench of sin. (laughs) But it's it's a pretty sobering thought if you think about it, because to us, it's not a. And all of the ordinances about washing. Oh yeah. And cleaning. Keeping everything clean. Keeping everything clean. I mean. Well, you know, I like to watch documentaries about Egypt because mm -hmm. it's one of the places that people will actually research and. In spite of a lot of craziness in the Egyptian archaeology department, <laughs> one of the things that comes through about the Egyptians was that they liked things to be pretty clean. Mm-hmm. Um, they were very, the upper class especially, they wore white <laughs> in a desert. They wore white clothing, they wore cotton, they wore linen, they liked white. They liked things clean. They talked about bathing. And they called the shepherds, the Israelites, an abomination. They thought that they were just a low, low class of humanity because they lived with animals and they wore animal skins and that was just stinky and yucky and dirty and low and class. Who knows? Maybe, maybe that was what they called the Israelites. They called them stinky because they were an abomination. They were shepherds and they dealt with animals all the time. Yeah. And yet here these upper class of Egyptians, these slave masters, are clean, neat, Washing, but, but they were the ones left to clean up the mess after their workforce left. But you know, the way God sees it, God exposed it through the plagues. Yeah. It's a stench. It's filthy. It's bloody. There's blood oh. and dead frogs, and well, the blood, the hail, Nile River. Fire. They threw all those Egyptian or those uh, Israelite babies into the water, thinking mm-hmm. that oh, that would be a clean way to dispose of all these babies we're killing. Pretty much. And what did God do? Turn the Nile into blood. Turn the whole Nile into blood. I'm not fooled. Mm -hmm. I saw what you did. Yeah, because God knows. God saw the people and he knew. He knew. He knew what was going on. And the Nile River might look beautiful and clean and fresh, but no. It's it's a grave. It's a grave of countless babies they were throwing in there. So he turned it to blood. Made it show the way it really was, the way God saw it. He made everyone else see what God was seeing. Yep, and Egypt stank. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> the stench of Egypt. Well, it seems uh, like Egypt is uh, almost a parable for the world. Yes. It really is. Egypt, out, it, when you look at it, it's come out, come out of the world. And, you know, it's important to remember, <laughs> be clean. Be clean. Do not touch the unclean thing. Wash yourselves, as God says. Sanctify yourself. Sanctify yourself with the word. Wash. Wash. Be clean. Wash, wash, wash. Because your spirit needs to not stink. And we also talked about the darkness and how Goshen had light, but yet Egypt was in dark darkness. And God divided the light from the darkness between Goshen and Egyptians. So that's how God sees it, as dark and stinky. (laughs) <laughs> so well it's been 33 almost 34 minutes so that's a, long one. that's a long one hopefully we've kept you this long so you can hear about the stinky egypt <laughs> <laughs> next week we'll have to show your wine project oh yeah we're not having as many mishaps with the video either so that's good yeah we did tip the video over but it's probably not as amusing this week i thought last week was kind of funny <laughs> it was <laughs> All right, I think we're going to call it an evening, so say goodnight, Lauren. Good night, Lauren. She always does that. You always say that. (laughs) (laughs) Good night.